Next, let's talk about some specific things that can go wrong on an EKG. The first is torsade de pointe, also known simply as torsade. This is a very specific form of ventricular tachycardia, where the amplitudes of the beats are shifting in a wave-like progression. When you see a pattern like this, you should immediately recognize it as torsade. Also, you should know that anything that prolongs the QT interval predisposes to torsade. Some of these are genetic, as listed in the fact, but also there are many drugs that can lead to torsade. This next page and a half contains some very high yield information, namely specific pathological patterns that can be seen on an EKG. Rather than going through all the details for each one, we'll just highlight some of the more important points, and you can fill in the rest as you study. Atrial fibrillation occurs when the atria do not contract as they normally should. This results in an EKG tracing with irregularly irregular QRS complexes and absent P waves, which is characteristic. It can be very dangerous because it can lead to atrial stasis and subsequent clot formation, leading to embolic stroke. It's usually treated with medications such as beta blockers, as well as warfarin to thin the blood and reduce the risk of a stroke. Here, we can see on the bottom a normal EKG with regularly spaced QRS intervals and notable P waves. Compare that to above where we have irregularly spaced QRS intervals and no P waves. This is classic for atrial fibrillation. Atrial flutter is similar to atrial fibrillation, but instead of completely absent P waves, there is a sawtooth pattern to the flutter waves, meaning that they repeatedly go up and down in a predictable way. Next, we have the different types of AV block, also known as heart block. First degree AV block occurs when the PR interval is long, namely greater than 200 milliseconds. Otherwise, though, the EKG tracing looks pretty normal. For second degree heart block, there are two types, called Mobitz type 1 and Mobitz type 2. Mobitz type 1, also known as Winkybach, is when the PR interval gets longer and longer. Eventually, a QRS complex is completely dropped. Mobitz type 2, on the other hand, happens when there is just a random loss of QRS complexes without any change in the PR interval. The final type of heart block is third degree, which is when the atria and ventricles beat independently of one another. There are QRS complexes and there are P waves both present, but they don't have any relationship to one another. This is a very serious condition that can lead to fatal arrhythmias, like ventricular fibrillation, which is shown below. This is a rhythm that is basically total chaos. There are no patterns. When you see this, it means that the ventricle is not depolarizing in unison, like a ventricle should, but instead each different area is polarizing at a different time, so the heart does not properly pump out any blood. It's important to know that this is a fatal arrhythmia unless it is rapidly reversed. All right, that was a lot of information about the electrical activity of the heart and how it shows up on EKGs. Since this is pretty high yield material, let's go over it with a question. A 54-year-old man presents to your office with a one-day history of severe fatigue and weakness. He is a park ranger in Connecticut. EKG reveals P waves that are completely dissociated from QRS complexes. What is the etiologic agent behind this patient's disease? This is a bit tricky, but if you said Borrelia burgdorferi, you're correct. The EKG findings described here are typical of third degree AV block. Now this can be caused by many things, but one of them is Lyme disease. And as soon as you see that this patient works outdoors in Connecticut, the northeastern United States, you should immediately consider Lyme disease. And the causative organism of Lyme disease is Borrelia burgdorferi. Great job. Now let's switch gears again and talk more about pressure and how it is regulated throughout the body. First, let's make a quick mention of atrial natriuretic peptide, also known as ANP. This is a peptide that the atria release in response to higher pressure, and it leads to natriuresis, which just means losing sodium and water in the urine. Therefore, ANP contributes to lowering blood pressure. 
It's one of the few hormones that actually does this, since many of the other hormones that are involved in blood pressure regulation are involved in maintaining blood pressure at high levels. So ANP is a good one to remember. In the short term, the majority of blood pressure regulation is accomplished by baroreceptors and chemoreceptors. One thing to keep in mind is that there are receptors in both the aortic arch and in the carotid sinus, and the aortic receptors only respond to an increase in blood pressure. Baroreceptors work by sensing decreased stretch, and they decrease parasympathetic activity. This has the effect of increasing heart rate and therefore blood pressure. This mechanism can be exploited clinically with the carotid massage maneuver, in which rubbing the area of the carotid arteries can cause decreased heart rate and decreased blood pressure. However, this can also cause syncope if you're not careful. The carotid massage is often a useful maneuver to abolish certain arrhythmias. On the other hand, peripheral chemoreceptors sense arterial oxygen, CO2, and pH levels, and they transmit this information to the brain in order to regulate breathing. There are also central chemoreceptors, but this information is covered in more detail in the neurology section. This table about circulation through organs is a pretty small fact that is quite high yield. Please make sure to spend the time to memorize this. The liver gets the most blood. The kidney gets the most blood for its weight, and the heart extracts the most oxygen. This next image shows the normal pressures in the heart, as measured by a Swan-Gantz catheter. It's not terribly important for you to know these numbers, but you should remember that pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, or PCWP, is an approximation of left atrial pressure, and therefore of left ventricular diastolic pressure. That approximation is something that can appear in many questions. Also, you should know that with certain pathologies like mitral stenosis, the approximation that we talked about might not be true. When it comes to autoregulation of blood flow, each organ has its own way of maintaining its blood supply. You can read the specifics here, but the general idea is that organs increase their blood flow by vasodilation when perfusion pressure fails. The one exception to this rule is in the lungs, where hypoxia actually leads to vasoconstriction, with the idea being to not waste blood flow on an area of the lungs that's poorly ventilated. This concept is discussed in more detail in the respiratory section. Finally, we'll round out our discussion of cardiac physiology with a quick review of capillary fluid exchange. This tends to be an extremely high yield fact for the exam, and a proper understanding of this information is absolutely necessary for numerous cardiac diseases. Basically, in any capillary bed, there is a balance between four pressures that try to drive fluid in or out of the vessel. Hydrostatic capillary pressure tends to push fluid out of the capillaries. On the other hand, interstitial hydrostatic pressure tends to push fluid into the capillaries. Osmotic pressure works the opposite way. Plasma oncotic pressure tends to pull fluid into the capillary, whereas interstitial fluid oncotic pressure tends to pull fluid out of the capillary. Any disturbance in the balance between these four forces will lead to edema. Edema is excess fluid into the interstitium, and there are many causes of edema, several of which are listed here. Edema is a common pathophysiologic endpoint for multiple disease states, including heart failure, nephrotic syndrome, liver failure, various infections, and lymphatic blockage. For this reason, an understanding of capillary fluid exchange is vital to an understanding of multiple disease processes.